Welcome to this live stream with Dr. Rod Wilson. Dr. Rod Wilson is a familiar name and face with many of our Christian schools. He has worked as a pastor. He's also worked as a psychologist. Most recently, he was the president of the Regent College in Vancouver. We are pleased to have him here today to speak to us on student discipline. Is God against sin or for flourishing? I am pleased to welcome Dr. Rod Wilson and invite him to take the screen now. Thank you. Well, nice to be with you uh, today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share with you on this, uh, through this medium. One of my favorite things about doing uh, sessions and speaking to people is the before and after conversations, but I'm really thankful for the technology that allows us to uh, meet together like this. So welcome, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're with us today. Uh, this is a massive subject, uh, the subject of student discipline, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, and I suspect many of you are on this particular uh, seminar because of your own interest in the topic and your own concerns about how to deal with student discipline. It seems to be one that's increasing in emphasis and concern, and uh, hopefully our time together today will, will be of help to you as you uh, seek to understand how you discipline in your own school. So I want to start um, in a, uh, with a, a scenario, if you like, a case study that uh, will kind of get our, our juices going and thinking about this. My intent in our session today is to do a combination of presentation, so I'll be talking some of the time, and also uh, give you an opportunity to uh, chat with each other, depending on the context you're in and then have some time of question and answers or chat that come across uh, online. Uh, so we'll do that more towards the end. So I want to uh, put this scenario in front of you, which you can see on the screen there. As the school day ends, you go into the girls' restroom only to find that three students are vaping. Okay, many of you have experienced this in your school. Students in the washroom are, are vaping. And knowing your usual tendencies in this realm of what you normally are like when that kind of thing happens in the, in the girls' restroom, uh, three questions. What will you feel? What will you think? And what will you want to do? Okay, so don't, don't talk about what you do do or what you normally would do in this situation when you find students vaping in the washroom, but more what will you feel, what will you think, and what will you want to do? Uh, so I'm going to stop. Uh, let you have some dialogue. Hopefully you're sitting beside somebody you're comfortable with and you can chat with them or maybe in small groups. Uh, but respond to that situation. Students vaping in the restroom. What do you feel? What do you think? What do you want to do? And then uh, I'll call you back in a few moments. So let me interrupt your conversation at this point. Um, this is going to be a, a two-part conversation you're going to have. I'm going to interrupt you in the middle here. So as you've been thinking about this particular scenario of vaping in the washroom and what you feel and what you think and what you might want to do, I want to now take the conversation to a slightly different level and I want to give you a a paradigm that is kind of implicit in many disciplinary discussions and there's lots of discussion on restorative practices, lots of discussion on how you reinforce rules, lots of discussion on consequences for behavior. These are all things we wrestle with around the subject of discipline so-called. But I want to now talk just very briefly about uh, three ways that you can frame this discussion of vaping in the washroom. All right, so. I'm just going to talk about very briefly three ways this can, this can be framed. And then what I'm going to get you to do is go back into your conversation and talk about your tendencies in this area. They could be right tendencies, wrong tendencies, I'm not concerned about that. Just your particular tendencies. So the first one is to emphasize the behavior. So 
the dynamic here would be you go, you're going into the restroom or the washroom. Some of you in the US use a different word than we use in Canada. I'll just use washroom for, for short. You go into the washroom, you find three students vaping in the washroom. So your preoccupation is the behavior. They are vaping. And so the focus is on the behavior that's being in, that they're involved in. And then the comparison point is the rightness or wrongness of that in light of school rules. So your tendency is to look at what's being done, vaping, and then to look at school rules and see if that's right or wrong. So that's your paradigm. And so if there is a school rule that says, you know, thou shalt not vape, then you've got a rule that the behavior is going against. If there is no rule on vaping, you're going to be more oriented to, I need to talk to the principal, we need a rule on vaping because this should not be happening. So that's one orientation that some people bring to these kind of behaviors. The second one is to focus on people and their inner motivation for engaging in the behavior. So this doesn't look at the behavior per se. What it does is see, sees the behavior as symptomatic rather than problematic. So what the behavior is doing is not something that I'm now comparing rules and regulations or a rule book or a manual or a handbook to see if vaping is wrong. What I'm now doing is I'm looking at who is doing the vaping and what is behind their desire to do the vaping. So you might see things like, well, there was three of them in the girls' restroom and two of them are like two of the real key players in this school and one of them is kind of a disenfranchised player. So I wonder if the reason she's vaping with those two is because it's allowing her to feel social acceptance and value and because it, she's not really into vaping. She is vaping, but she's not really into vaping. The reason she's there is because she wants to be with those other two people because they're kind of the stars of the school and her association with them will help her credibility and will give her more social status in the system. That would be a way of thinking about the vaping, not as a behavior compared to rules, but as symptomatic of something that says something about the individuals who are engaging in the vaping. So then the dynamic is, I need to know the people in order to provide appropriate discipline. The first one, I need to know the behavior and the rule book. The second one, I need to know the people and what's driving them to do this. The third paradigm is to see the behavior as replacing something that is more desirable. So what you're comparing now is, in the first one, you're comparing the behavior with rules. In the second one, you're comparing behavior with people's intent or motivation or aspiration. In the third one, you're saying, this is a less than ideal behavior. What is it these three students could be doing that achieves the same ends, but is a more desirable behavior than vaping? And so in your conversations with them, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring out what, what in fact could you do to achieve the ends you're trying to achieve by vaping that is not vaping? You're actually going to replace it with something else. So this is a behavior replacement model and your focus then is not just on what's being done and who's doing it, but actually asking the question, how should this behavior cease so another behavior can start. Now, the fourth option, of course, good multiple choice test, you got A, you got B, you got C, and D is some combination. So what's your tendency? When you think of you and the way you come at discipline, and if you had that situation with these three students vaping in the washroom, which way would you tend to lean? Would it be A, would it be B, would it be C, or would it be some combination? So see if you can articulate that at to your neighbor and I'll give you a few moments to continue that conversation. So let me call you back again uh, from your discussion and hopefully you've been able to articulate some of your uh, your own leanings, your own tendencies, haven't been necessarily evaluating them but just talking about how you tend to lean in these kind of circumstances. Um, those of you who already have uh, watched the other workshop that I did here or will be watching it later, uh, both the workshops that I've done for this conference have the same underlying paradigm in it, and that's a biblical approach to the word shalom or the English word flourishing. And so as you know, this conference is called flourishing, and I think one of the things 
uh, that's important for us to do is to seek to understand at the core what it means to be flourishing and how we root that in who we are as a Christian. And one of my concerns, and I, my apologies in advance if this is offensive to you, but one of my concerns in the Christian school movement is a lot of people think a Christian school is a school that has staff, all of whom have a personal relationship with Jesus. So if you just hire a bunch of people that have a personal relationship with Jesus, you have a Christian school. I would argue that that is not the case. Simply having a personal relationship with Jesus doesn't make you a Christian school. For a Christian school to be Christian, it needs to have a deep understanding of what it means to be a Christian and what the Christian story is about. So something like vaping in the washroom on the surface doesn't look very Christian. Um, I, you know, you look up under V in your online concordance, you're not going to find vaping in the Bible. I mean, this is not a biblical construct, vaping. Uh, some of you might want to call it sin. Some of us would not necessarily call it sin. Uh, some of you might just think it's an undesirable behavior. A lot of us would think, well, there's really no way to think Christianly about vaping. Like, you know, it's not a Christian subject. I would argue that if it's a Christian school, you will have a way of thinking Christianly about how to deal with vaping. Uh, so with that backdrop, uh, let's push into this a little bit and try to understand this underlying template. Uh, one of the things we know in the Christian story is the Christian story has four big chapters. Creation, where everything was good. Fall, where things were not good. Redemption, where things were good, but not completely good. And then consummation, where things were good again. So those four chapters in the, the biblical record of creation, fall, redemption, consummation, are the framework we bring to what it means to be Christian. So when we go to creation, not start with sin, it's one of the problems Christians often have, we always want to start with sin and then go quickly to Jesus, but where we need to start is in creation. And what was creation? The key phrase in creation, God saw that it was good and that it was very good. And so when God created, he designated that all these things were good. Humanity was in right relationship with him, they were in right relationship with creation, and they were in right relationship with each other. And so this sense of things being good was good in terms of you and God, good in terms of you and creation, and good in terms of you and each other. That was God's desire. You could use synonyms, English synonyms, for this good word. Uh, the word could be wholeness. Uh, the word could be harmony, it could be completeness, it could be integration, it could be unity, it could be delight. And to come to the word we're using in this conference, it could be flourishing. So when you think of creation, all these words apply to creation. It was whole, it was harmonious, it was complete, it was integrated, there was unity, there was delight, there was flourishing. All these words apply to God's good creation as he set this up as his ideal. The best word in English to capture this in the Bible is the word peace. And so in the, often when we use the word peace, we think peace is the absence of conflict. But in biblical terms, peace is the presence of flourishing. And there's a subtle difference between these two. Peace as the absence of conflict versus peace as the presence of flourishing. So when you understand it that way, the Hebrew word shalom is probably the best way to capture it. Any of you visited Israel, or have Jewish friends will know one of the words that they often use as they communicate one, with one another is the word shalom. Uh, that word in Hebrew is used over 250 times in the Old Testament and over 90 times in the New Testament. And this word shalom doesn't mean the absence of the bad, but the presence of flourishing, that there's something good happening. There's something really, really uh, better happening than this thing that was not ideal. And that's what creation did. It created that sense of flourishing and that sense of the ideal. So what is sin? So if we were to ask the question, what is sin? Or what is behavior that doesn't seem ideal? Or, or what is behavior that doesn't seem best within our schools? Uh, let me use uh, Plantinga's uh, definition here from his book uh, called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He says sin is disruption of created harmony and then resistance to divine restoration of that harmony. Listen to this sentence, a really important one for us as Christians. God hates sin, not just because it violates his law, but more substantively because it violates shalom, because it breaks the peace, because it interferes with the way things are supposed to be. God is for shalom 
and therefore against sin. In fact, we may safely describe evil as any spoiling of shalom. In short, sin is culpable shalom breaking. Now you see what Plantain is doing here with this definition of sin. What he's saying is in order to define sin well, we need to define the ideal, the good, the best, the whole, the integrated, the flourishing. Because when we define the good and the flourishing and the best and the integrated, then we recognize that sin spoils that. Sin breaks that. Sin disrupts that. And now what sin becomes is sin is, to use his language here, sin is actually shalom breaking. When sin occurred, you remember the four chapters in the big biblical story, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. When the fall came, what was the problem with the fall, with what Adam and Eve did, with their engagement in disobedience to God? What was the difficulty there? The difficulty there was they spoiled the ideal. They spoiled creation. They harmed creation. Their relationship with God had problems. Their relationship with each other had problems. Their relationship with creation had problems. And so sin then, and we're going to come back to vaping. For those of you who wondered if we lost vaping, we haven't lost vaping. We're coming back to that. But the fundamental premise is that God is not just against things. God is for things. And listen to this. The reason he's against things because it gets in the way of what he's for. And so as an educator, I think one of the things we need to ask ourselves as, ed- as teachers, so if I went to the students that you taught and I said to them, is this teacher against things or is this teacher for things? And have you noticed some of us, even as Christians, can get into the mindset that being a Christian is against something rather than for something. So let me get you to engage on this a little bit. Two questions. In what way is the vaping behavior an expression of shalom breaking or spoiling God's ideal? And how might that impact your feeling, your thinking, and your behavioral tendency? Some of you might think vaping is sin, some of you might not. Some of you might see it as morally neutral. It doesn't really matter how you class it. What I want you to think about is, is this vaping behavior in the washroom shalom breaking or is it spoiling God's ideal? And what is God's ideal? If you're going to tell these three students, stop vaping, what would you want to replace that with? What would God prefer? Is being a Christian not vaping or is being a Christian not vaping and doing something else? So let me give you again a few minutes Uh, to chat with your neighbor and to see how you respond to these two questions. Okay, let me invite you back again and appreciate some of the comments that are online. I think a lot of you are um, grappling with this material in really helpful ways. I love the comment of somebody saying, you know, I just deal with the behavior if I have 30 seconds. If I have longer, I deal with the person. And then if we have longer to discuss it, we deal with the bigger question, which I think is very true in a lot of schools. Sometimes the efficiency of time becomes a dynamic in all of that. So we'll look forward to coming back to some of that again. Now, I want to now move and talk about Jesus. And, uh, you know, if I was to title this in a humorous way, I would say, what does Jesus have to do with vaping? Um, so let's, let's explore Jesus a little bit here. Because remember, this is the third part of the big four chapter story, right? Creation, fall and now redemption epitomized by Jesus and obviously rooted in the character of God, which goes back to creation. So, you know, trick question. You know, you try this in your elementary school or high school next week when you're back to school, you know, say to the students, why did Jesus come? And everyone will put up their hand and say, to forgive us of our sins, to die on the cross. And, you know, technically that is an accurate answer. But when we push into the biblical material carefully, and we ask the biblical material, and maybe more directly we ask Jesus, um, why did you come? Now, if you ask that question, why did you come, and then you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the answer to that question is very clear, because Jesus makes it clear, I have come to bring the kingdom. That's what he says. Now, our answer is he came to die on a cross and save us from our sins, which is true. But he says, I came to bring the kingdom. 
Now, if you go to the biblical material on Jesus, he says, I came to bring the kingdom. How do you get into the kingdom? You repent of your sins. Now, this is where, this is a major theological issue, so we don't have time to unpack all of this today, but this is where we've got to be really careful and precise with how we understand this. Jesus came to announce his kingdom. And, of course, this is an echo of creation and the fall, right? There's a restoration, there's a redemption in Jesus' coming to deal with the fall and to deal with creation. So that's why he's come. And he's come to announce a kingdom, and it's a future kingdom. And almost all of what he talks about is the nature of the kingdom. But in order to get into that kingdom, you need to repent of your sins. So the negation aspect of the gospel is in tandem with the affirmation aspect of the gospel. Okay? So you get in by repenting of your sins. That's the negation aspect. But the affirmation aspect is you come into the kingdom and you start functioning in the kingdom. This is why the parables, of course, are not about forgiveness of sins. They're about how the kingdom works. Jesus' whole emphasis is on the repentance of sins is a prelude to actually working for the kingdom, on behalf of the kingdom, in step with the kingdom, working with the king, being in relationship with the king of that kingdom, being in relationship with Jesus so you can accomplish his purposes. So what you have here is a, is a combination of leaving the one and cleaving to the other. I leave sin in order to cleave to the kingdom. I negate sin in order to be part of the kingdom. The ticket in is the negation of sin, and that's how I get in the room. Now, what does repent mean? And this becomes very important because... Many of us grew up with the notion that repent means feel terrible for what you've just done, right? So you've been in these situations as I have, you know, somebody's messed up financially, messed up in their marriage, messed up here, messed up there, and we go and we say, wow, they don't seem very repentant. They don't seem very upset for what they've done. And we look at their face or their body or their tone, or, and we say, well, clearly they're not repenting because we can't see them feeling sorry for their sins. The Greek word for repentance in the New Testament is the word metanoia. And what that means is not, I feel bad about what I did. What it means is, I look at what I did honestly, and I turn around and I move in a completely different direction. That's what metanoia means. That's what repent means. And so repentance is not looking at my sin and feeling, oh, I feel awful, and I feel way more awful than you feel, and I feel ten times more awful than all my friends, so I must be really repentant. That's not repentance. Repentance is a clear look at my sin, declaring it for what it is. It is sin against God, and then it's turning and moving in another way. To come back to what I'm saying here about um, about Jesus, when I follow Jesus and when I move into the kingdom, what I'm doing is I'm declaring that my sinful life is not a life I want to pursue. I need those sins forgiven by Jesus and I move into the kingdom and I'm pursuing that kind of work. This is why, have you ever noticed, uh, you know, with our sort of formulation sometimes of conversion, we say, like, you need to feel really, really terrible for your sins and have these broken, like, emotional, distraught moments, and then you accept Jesus as your Savior. That's what the gospel is. And then you come to the disciples and the gospels. Like, find me a passage where the disciples are weeping about their sin. Find me a passage in the Gospels where the disciples have any material at all in the biblical record where they say, oh, I feel terrible for the life I've lived before. I don't want to do this anymore. What we see in the Gospels is disciples. And what are disciples? Disciples are people who've negated their own life and have sought to follow Jesus. So the biblical emphasis in the Gospels is not all these long chapters and how terrible everybody feels about their sin. The biblical emphasis is metanoia. They've changed. They've turned. They're moving in a completely different direction, and they're following Jesus. And what they recognize is what they're not... Pers they're forgetting God is not what they want to do anymore. They don't want to forget God. They don't want to define good on their terms anymore. They want to define it on God's terms. They don't want to pursue independence from God. They want to be in relationship with God. 
And so what they want to do, and I, I hopefully the people listening to this, you're in the same boat as me, what I want to do is I want to pursue kingdom life. I want to pursue the life of Jesus. And when I pursue the life of Jesus and flourishing and wholeness and integration and shalom, that's what I'm moving towards. That's what I'm really emphasizing. That's what I'm taking seriously. And Jesus' invitation is not just an invitation to negate or say no or leave, right? It's really important to emphasize this. That's not what Jesus is inviting us to. It's not just a life of negating and saying no and leaving, but it's a life of affirming and saying yes and saying cleaving. They can say, what does this have to do with vaping? I'm coming to that in a moment. We're going to go back to our vapors in the bathroom in a moment. But the call to follow Jesus is not stopping sin. That's not the Christian life. The call to follow Jesus is stopping, negating, moving past, and moving in the direction of following Jesus. And that envelops us. I'm not committed to the life of sin anymore in negation. I'm affirming the life of the kingdom as epitomized in Jesus. Now, let me give you a biblical passage where this shows up explicitly. And so let's look at this one uh, together. I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 4, verses, uh, some of the verses between 25 and 32. Okay, And remember what I just said about Jesus' call is not a call to negation, nor is it a call to affirmation. It's both. We negate a lifestyle and we affirm another lifestyle. So let's ask this question of verse 25 in Ephesians 4. Here's the question. Um, is a Christian a person who doesn't lie? Is a, is a Christian a person who doesn't engage in falsehood, to use the, the uh, Ten Commandment image? Is that what a Christian is? Verse 25 of Ephesians 4 would say, no, that is not a Christian. What is a Christian? Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, you see the paradigm there? It's the paradigm of negation. We must put off falsehood and affirmation. We must speak truthfully to our neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Notice what the verse does not say is people who never say anything are being Christian because they're not telling lies. <laughs> You know, so you have this quiet grade 11 student in your class who never says anything, and you think, oh, they're such a, they're such a godly person because they never say anything bad. Well, verse 25 would say that's a problem. Because we don't stop sinning in order to move into neutrality. We stop sinning in order to move into kingdom life. And what is kingdom life? We speak truthfully to our neighbor and because we're all members of one body. Let's say we go to somebody and we say, you're a Christian, you need to stop stealing. Christians don't steal. And so people are sitting around going, oh, I'm such a Christian, I'm not stealing. Is that what it means to be a Christian? No, it's not. Look at verse 28. 28. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with, useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Again, what is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? It's not about whether they're stealing or not. That's not the issue. The issue is, have they stopped stealing and now they're working, and they're doing something useful, and they're actually benefiting other people. Because you see, stealing is robbing other people. It's taking things away from other people. Being a Christian means I'm doing things for other people. So again, you have this negation affirmation paradigm. Look at verse 29, similar to verse 25. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So you have some friends, I have some friends too. They never say anything to anybody. So you think, well, they don't speak in an unwholesome way. They're very Christian because they never, you know, they never tell dirty jokes. They never say inappropriate things. They're never rude. They're never insensitive. They never say anything. Is that Christian? Well, this verse would suggest it's not. A Christian is not somebody who stops speaking in an unwholesome way. A Christian is somebody who says things that are helpful for building others up according to their needs so they benefit. And again, you see this leaving, cleaving paradigm brought to bear on it. Look at verse 31. Attitudinal things. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So again, you see that shift. A Christian is not somebody who's not bitter. 
or isn't into big rage or brawling or slandering or into malice. That's not a Christian. A Christian is somebody who stops those things through the work of the Spirit and then starts being kind and compassionate and forgiving. And notice what Paul does here. He slips in the reason for that right at the end as he does in some of these other verses. Just as in Christ God forgave you. When you're following Jesus and he's the king of the kingdom, then you do stuff that makes sense to him. Because that's now where your allegiance lies. Your allegiance doesn't lie in the unwholesome talk. So let me take that and encourage you to reflect for a moment. Um, using this Ephesians 4 and some of the things I've said about Jesus, using that template of negate and affirm, how might you approach the vaping incident when you think of negating and affirming? So again, let me give you uh, a few minutes to chat about that together. Using that template, how might you approach the vaping incident? Okay, let me uh, call you back again. Um, I've been enjoying the interaction on the, uh, the chat box as you've been having your conversation. And again, really appreciate just the way that you're grappling with some of these questions and issues. And I think embedded in some of the things that have been said on the chat box, there's a number of questions that have been raised. So let me try and address those uh, from coming from you uh, directly. Uh, completely agree with the person who said that it is turning around, but there is contrition and using the example of the Pharisee and the publican parable, as well as the, the situation of David in Psalm 51. Um, I think what we need to be, I mean, we're talking about an emphasis here, I think, so not, it's not a dichotomous thing. I think what we've got to be careful of is if we push emotional responses to sin, then uh, people like me, for example, who grew up in the church, grew up in a Christian home, um, you know, when sin was presented to me, like I, you know, kind of got it as a kid, but I wasn't feeling like horrendous about it or like just broken hearted. It wasn't sort of murder or adultery or anything like really awful or terrible. And so my desire to follow Jesus was not linked with this depth of emotion over uh, my sinful life. But when I think about, you know, forgetting God, ignoring who he is, defining good in my terms, living independent of God, as sort of a posture of life, I think, yeah, like, that's so me. Like, and, and that's really not good for God. It's not good for me. <clears throat> and I'm assessing and I'm reflecting on the fact that this life of sin is not something I want to pursue. And I really want to churn. I want to change. I want to be in the kingdom. I want to follow Jesus. And so there's more of a, a desire to follow than there is like completely dominated by the contrition. And of course, the other component of this too is the severity of the sin and the age of the person. Uh, so often, this is a real problem for people like me who've grown up in Christian homes where, you know, I remember as a kid thinking, I haven't repented enough because I don't feel bad enough. And you can get yourself in some bondage with that. So an appropriate caution, I think that uh, person who raised that is exactly right. A number of you've mentioned, I think really helpfully, that in these moments, like, you know, school's over, you're ready to go home, you go in the washroom to turn off the light, and there's three kids in there vaping, and you're just like, ah, you're just frustrated, you want to get home, and you're mad, and you're not thinking about philosophies of discipline and negating and affirming and shalom, like, you could care less about all that stuff. You're just like, stop vaping, I want to go home. Um, so I think often what schools need to do is not make all the disciplines sort of instinctive things in the moment, but actually have a philosophy, a mindset. I would argue strongly for one that's informed biblically and theologically about what God desires and some of the things we've been talking about today. So develop that as a, a philosophy of how your school does discipline. And then, as is true with all education, like then teach it model it, describe it. When, when parents come for the orientation, say to parents, when your kid messes up in this school, here's what we do and here's why we do it. Um, what I'm noticing in Christian schools is schools that lean that way 
things work out better, but schools that go on that everyone does what's right in their own mind. So, you know, this teacher, he just gets mad at students when they step out of line. He's always mad, and everyone knows that. Like, when the siblings come up, they know that's the mad teacher. Like, he just does wrong, he just gets mad at you. And this teacher over here sits down beside you and talks to you, and this teacher over here is into restorative practices, and this teacher... That is not a school that has a unified philosophy and discipline, but it's more individualized. And I think that, that creates confusion for students and parents. But uh, I would encourage that, you know, to have something that um, allows for a, a more undergirding philosophy that's rooted in what it means to be Christian. I think that's a really important uh, component of this. Um, the other comment that was made, I think, really helpfully was around escalation. And of course, Typically, when, and we know this from neuroscience, when, when there's a situation that's more of a crisis that, that students are in and we're in, we get escalated emotionally, and some of us, depending on our history and our background and how much trauma we've experienced, it can really send us, and, and we start reacting instinctively and impulsively and not thoughtfully and reflectively. And I've noticed in my own life, in disciplinary situations, whether it's with my own children or other people's children or adults or whatever, Often time is needed, and so you might, you know, do a, an immediate intervention in the afternoon to say, you know, stop the vaping, blah, 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 but then you might say, we're going to meet tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock and we're going to discuss this, and then things have calmed down by then, and you can have these kind of dialogues back and forth. Uh, that's more work, but sometimes I think the outcome uh, is a lot better. And then the other uh, comment that was raised, which I think is a really important one, is around consequences. Um, Consequences are certainly a component of discipline, and I think to negate consequences is problematic. However, if it's consequences to the exclusion of anything else, then I think we get into trouble, because what needs to be learned is something that's going to help that child grow and develop and mature. And if all that's brought to bear are consequences, then there may not be a full understanding of all the dynamics around it. So um, I haven't been stopped much for speeding, but I have been stopped a number of times for speeding. And you know, you're pulled over and you roll the window down and, and the officer's standing there and she says you were speeding. And my first comment was like, I'm in a hurry. And what I'm doing is I'm giving her a reason for why I did what I did. And often it's a legitimate reason. I read a really important meeting and the traffic is bad and I need to be at this meeting and it's really important to at this meeting, it's a crisis meeting and I need to be there. And, and as, I'm, as I'm giving my reason, she's typing my ticket up. And of course what she's doing philosophically is she is not taking my reason and converting it into an excuse. What she's doing is saying there are consequences for speeding independent of the reason that you did what you did. Yes, you did have an important meeting. Yes, it is a crisis meeting. Yes, it is important that you're there. Yes, there was really bad traffic in that previous intersection which slowed you down, but I'm still giving you a ticket because this behavior demands this consequence. But the, the explanation in the context of a school is an important part of the dialogue. And particularly in a Christian school where often the students are there for you know, most of their growing up years, and so there's chances to work with and understand uh, what's going on with people. So again, a very helpful uh, helpful thing. And then another person mentioned this whole issue of you getting escalated be for whatever reason. Like maybe, you know, we know about the amygdala in the brain that it's, you know, it's the trigger function. And so, you know, I said vaping. For some of you, like that brings back memories of you being caught smoking in the, in the washroom in your Christian school. Uh, maybe if I change the illustration, it would trigger some others of you that are in that. Um, and we need to be mindful that we need to steward our amygdalas. If you just woke up, you have no clue what I just said, but we need to steward our amygdalas because there is instinctive responses sometimes that aren't ideal for the other. Um, so when, I, you know, when I'm in an educational setting and I see a teacher who just gets mad at students because they do something wrong and just punishes them because they're doing it wrong, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure this punishment is in the best interest of that student. I think you're punishing them simply because you're mad. And that's your stuff. It's not their stuff. And it's, it's interesting in the biblical record in Ephesians 6 and 4, when Paul talks about the anger of children, do you remember who he held responsible? You know, parents, don't exasperate your children. And in this context, I would say, teachers, don't exasperate your students. Like, don't, don't by your own stuff create anger in them in the process of discipline. But, hey... 
that's human, that's normal, we all do it, I do it, uh, but we need to steward some of our own uh, instinctive responses. So we just have a minute or two left. Let me just uh, check the chat box again. Um, yep, the cooling down comment, really helpful. And uh, yep, consequences is the start and reconciliation and restoration come, uh, come later. That's a, that's a very accurate point. So let me go to the last slide, uh, just to finish off today. And this may seem like an odd slide, I think maybe I made a mistake here, because it uh, looks like a parking lot, uh, an underground parking lot with two cars. And in fact, it is an underground parking lot with two cars in it. <laughs> so uh, we live in a townhouse in Vancouver, and uh, in our underground parking lot, my car is uh, the car on the right there in that slide. That's my, uh, my Honda CRV. And then on the left is my uh, neighbor who has this really flashy 1995 Mazda sports car. Uh, coveting is not one of my big sins, but I do have to admit when I go to the parking lot very often, I look at my neighbor's car and think, I don't want an SUV Honda. I really want that little Mazda sports car with the convertible on it. Uh, but that's another seminar for another time. I'm not talking about coveting now. But notice beside my car, there's a steel pillar. I, I, I'm sorry, a concrete pillar beside my car on the passenger side. You can see that there. And then there's a very little space and then her car. And let me speak metaphorically for a moment and I think you'll get the point. When I come down into our underground parking lot of our townhouse and I'm thinking this, okay, and some of you park in narrow underground parking spots, you know what I'm about to say. You come into the parking spot and you think, oh my goodness, my neighbor's sports car, which he loves, is on the left, and there's this concrete pillar on the right. I don't want to hit the car. I don't want to hit the pillar. Oh, I don't want to hit the pillar. I don't want to hit the car. Oh, my, my rear view mirror's close to the pillar. No, it's close to the car. And what ends up happening to me is I have to hit the brakes and stop. Like, I literally have to hit the brakes and stop because I'm trying to pay attention to this and to this, and it paralyzes me. What I need to do is recognize that the concrete pillar is stable, you know, she parks in different places. Sometimes she parks closer to me, sometimes she parks farther to me, but she never goes over the line. But the concrete pillar is my guidepost. And when I drive into that underground parking spot, my whole focus needs to be on that concrete pillar. That's the ultimate, that's the ideal. And when I do that, the rest falls into place. So when I park my car with preoccupation with the one or the other or the other or the one or this or that, it paralyzes me. I don't know what to do. But when I take something that's stable, like a concrete pillar, and I park my car in light of that, everything else falls into place. And it reminds me when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Make Jesus' righteousness... And in the context of what we're talking about in discipline, make Jesus shalom, make Jesus flourishing, make Jesus good life as he defines it, the concrete pillar as you're parking your car. And when you do that, you'll still have to deal with discipline, you'll still have to deal with vaping in the washroom, but all this will fall into place because you'll be constantly pursuing the ideal. So God bless you and give you help to deal with this very challenging part of Christian education discipline and flourishing. Thanks for being with us.